Hello and welcome to the latest episode of the Ride It Out show. Let's play that intro. We have a cracker lined up for you today and this one is off the back of one of the many messages that we've received since launching the channel where people are inspired by what we're doing or where the ethos of rider resilience really resonates with them where riding bikes has helped them to get through times of hardship when the going gets tough. But before I get into too much detail about this episode's guest I just want to thank one of our sponsors and this episode is not sponsored by a brand or a company, but by a person, a guy called Richard Munro. Um, he's local to me here in the Lake District, here in Kendall, and he set up something called the Gen Ride. Now, the Gen Ride was set up in memory of the late Gen Hill, who sadly passed away in 2015 after her battle with, uh, with lung cancer. I never got to meet Jen, um, but I do know her husband very well, a guy called Tom Hill, and um, through kind of meeting up with him and talking about Jen, I feel like I've got a little bit of an insight into why she was so well liked within the bicycle community. As far as I know, Jen was the epitome of rider resilience and kept spreading her pedals as long as she could before she sadly passed away. So the Gen Ride is a two-day bike packing event that takes place annually in the English Lake District and historically has always raised money for two different charities. One of them has always been St Gemma's Hospice, which is the hospice that supported Jen and her family and friends before and after her passing. And the other charity has changed on an annual basis, uh, depending on who Rich felt could do with a little bit of support. Now this year I'm really fortunate to say that the charity Rich has chosen is us, Ride Resilience, and that will really allow us to support other organisations who share our ethos, who are supporting people to get out on, on bikes and to help more people to get through those rougher times of life by you know, t turning to the, to the humble bicycle. For the first time ever, there's also a gravel element to the Gen Ride this year. Historically, it always used to be a mountain bike oriented event. Um, there is a gravel event uh, at the same time this year. So if you haven't got a mountain bike or if you want to, um, you know, stick to the kind of like easier paths, not as chunky, um, the gravel ride would be a good option to look at. Either way, if you're struggling with the kind of February and, uh, you know, late January blues, um, you're struggling to get out, you need something to aim towards and look forward to or train for, I would full-heartedly um, suggest you sign up to, to the Gen Ride this year. It'll take place at the end of May. I will put the links to the sign up in the description. And yeah, just remember, you're not only uh, giving yourself something to aim towards, but you're also helping us to do more, which, uh, which we will be massively grateful for. Okay, so back to today's guest. Um, so today's guest is an elite mountain bike racer who up until recently um, did everything in life with a, a disability without, I suppose, people outside of his immediate uh, groups of friends and family uh, knowing about it. Now, it wasn't until his girlfriend found out that she made him realise that what he was managing to achieve was highly inspirational and that by going public with his story, he would likely inspire a lot of other people to not give up on their dreams and to you know realize their full potential regardless of any disability so without further ado this is my chat with james anderson james anderson thanks so much for joining us and taking the time to come and have a little chat with us on uh, on rider resilience um i kind of wanted to i mean was inspired by your story you obviously reached out to us um, saying that you're really keen to share what you refer to as uh, your hidden disability. So really keen to kind of get a little bit more information about you, your background and, um, you know, where where you've come from and what kind of riding means to you. Well, first off, yeah, thanks for having me. Um, 
I, I love the show and I love what you're doing. It's amazing and uh, really wanted to be part of it. So um, me, in a nutshell, I am, I don't know, I thought about this the other day as I've got older. I'm just a mountain biker, really. I love the sport or cyclist as a whole, really. Um, so I started riding from the age of 13, um, like mountain bikes, uh, obviously rode since I was younger. Um, and then found downhill mountain biking, uh, 14, 15 years old and didn't look back since really. And, um, yeah, I'd say I am, it's like, it's part of me now, uh, if that makes sense. So everything I do every day on a daily basis, pretty much goes towards making myself better. And I think, um, what we owe us, owe the sport um, of cycling and mountain biking is that it's got a vehicle to th these sports give us a vehicle to make ourselves better on a daily basis whatever that is so um yeah just super grateful i found the sport and i pretty pretty sure that's me in a nutshell really i just yeah i love the the sport as a whole and yeah constantly striving to make myself better racing and and riding and just a, as a human being so yeah and, and how did you how did you get into racing? I mean, obviously you started riding mountain bikes, or you started riding bikes probably at the age of thirteen. You mentioned, but when did you really get into racing, and how did you discover that you, you know, you're obviously a talented rider? Yeah, uh, so I I found racing um, when I was younger. I so the Athertons lived by me at the time, and uh, they're a, a massive name in the sport, and. Um, my mum took me to a local race, uh, a place literally 10 minutes up the road from my folks' house, um, a place called Mulfrey, uh, for the Fat Face night ride race it was at the time. And uh, I went and watched watched that and uh, actually got to meet G and and, uh, and the Athertons. And that kind of kick-started it all, really. Um, and I was like, this is incredible. Like, And it was so... It was so because we we live in quite a rural area here in Wales, and um, it was quite accessible. So I just wanted to get a mountain bike from then and and just have a go myself. And I think my first my very first race was actually in Forrester Dean at one of the mini downhill races, which is uh, which is a great way to get in the sport. Um, so yeah, I started off. That was my very first race, and then I went to the Kersus Cup series at the time which was really cool. It was like a five round race series in mid Wales and then started doing all them and just, just got the bug really. And, and yeah, just didn't look back and I'm uh, 29 now and uh, just still love it more than ever. So yeah, that's where it all started. And so when did you start getting sponsored then? I mean, obviously somebody must've um, um, kind of noticed your talent. Did they come to you? Did you approach um, potential sponsors? Or how, how did that work? <laughs> I've always had like, uh, to a degree, I've always had some level of support. Um, very lucky that I've um, been able to have that, really, because obviously it's an expensive sport. Um, so I think my very first sponsorship um, came through a chap called Steve Parr that used to run the National Downhill Series. Uh, and he he sponsored me with a brand at the time, MDE Bikes, Italian brand. Uh, and that's when I was in junior uh, going into the expert category, which is like just below the elite category. Um, and then started riding for them, did that for a few years, um, stopped when I went to university um, and I bought an exercise science at uni. Actually, that was I stopped racing and riding altogether for a year and a bit, which was really yeah, that was that was a period in my life where I was like I played some different sports and stuff. Um, but then I always always showing people the like, oh, this is what I used to do and I used to get it in uni, like, oh wow, that's amazing. Like, why did you used to do it? And eventually those thing those conversations, I was like, Yeah, well, why don't I do it anymore? And um yeah, that I that was a period that, like I said, I walked away from the sport a little bit. And um, then I came back and then I raced from the senior category all the way up to elite. And then when I got to elite, I started racing for Orange Bikes at the time. Um, so that was twenty. That was in 2020. And then that came to an end this year, just gone 2022. So I rode for them for three years. 
Amazing. Now, I mean, obviously, the um, the reason we're talking on this podcast, this YouTube episode, um, is to do with your hidden disability. So tell us a little bit more about that. I mean, obviously, um, it's not you know evident to anyone. It's something that you've sort of decided to to start talking about more openly quite recently. Um, so, so what is it, and what does that involve then? Yeah, so my condition is monoplegia. So it's a very acute form of cerebral palsy, which um, affects my right side. Um, mainly my range of motion in my right ankle and my knee and across my hips. So um, basically I wake up most days and I've got extreme tightness all the way up my right hand side um into my lower back and in my calf muscle and that's something that just happens and i have to keep on top of that by stretching and uh foam rolling and just generally being active um uh so if i was to take my shoes off and show you basically my my feet the range of motion is great on my left side but on my right side it's like i'm trying to do it with my brain and, and move my my leg to to like clip out if you will my foot sorry um but aren't it's it's like um it's a motor when i was born i was starved of oxygen to one side of my brain so there's like a a form of brain damage as well so it, it stops movement to a degree to one side but um with that being said i found mountain biking and cycling really quite young and i was able to work on it so i'm still able to um strengthen this right hand side because i was born with severe muscle deficiency throughout my right hand side of my body um but that being said like i said i've been able to train and, and work on it to strengthen it um to where it is now and it's, it's it's in a good position now so i just have to keep on top of you know my stretches and, and foam rolling to to keep to keep it to keep it good and to the second point of your question about me talking about it more openly um my girlfriend's been amazing to help me open up about it because it's something that i've hidden for a long time because i didn't want to lean on it for excuses um because i still compete in able body sport um but as she explained to me it's 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 something that i should be proud of to where i've got to now with it and also telling my story Telling my story can can help people as well that may be um, struggling with whatever they're going through. Because um, honestly, when I found this sport, um, you know, if I hadn't have found it, put it this way, if I hadn't have found it, I don't know what I would be like physically and mentally, if that makes sense. Because um, this sport has just given me everything in, in terms of I've been able to train for for a goal, and that goal and training for that goal has helped build my strength throughout my right side of my body um and honestly it's yeah it's made me the athlete and person i am now like so i'm really grateful for it and and telling this story and you know coming on here and you giving the opportunity to tell it a bit more is is what i'm really passionate about now so um hopefully like i said it can help um inspire people and and um just yeah get more people out on bikes and enjoying what we do so yeah you mentioned, you know, this is something that was the result of being starved of oxygen at birth. Um, so it's something effectively that you were born with. But were you diagnosed straight away at birth or did it take a few years um, for you to be diagnosed with it? How does that work then? So obviously it was like um, my parents knew there was complications from, from birth. Um, so they were aware of what's gone on. Um, it was like touch and go at the time. Um but as I got older, I was starting to show like, um, what's the word? Like, you know, they could just, the doctors and my parents could pick up. There wasn't things quite right. I'd be falling from on the one side and uh, I'd be walking with a limp. Uh, that's something that I still walk with. I still walk with a limp, um, but quite, quite heavily. So I went to Older Hay Hospital. Uh, to, I was in and out of there regularly having uh, CAT scans on my head as a kid and uh, they were working out what was going on and um, like the scans came back and I had like a dark spot around my brain which is where the damage has occurred and, and then it's obviously transferred down into the to the right side of my body and, and shut off elements of movement. Um, 
so yeah, that was that was when I was around five, five or six, I think. Uh, Mum said so, uh, and then from then, once they'd established what the condition was, uh, I got diagnosed with monoplegia, and then I was sent to Osestry Orthopaedic Hospital um, to basically learn to walk properly in a like a proper gait they call it so heel toe heel toe try and to, to walk rather than what i was doing which was almost like a club foot so at this point i'm about you know near 10 years old um and i had to have an orthotic splint um that i had to wear throughout school um, which was a nightmare because i didn't want to wear it basically but it would hold my hold my leg in a position to stretch my calf if that makes sense because what we're trying to do is is um elongate the muscle that was really thin and basically keep it in a position that it would teach me to walk heel toe heel toe rather than just smack in the floor um so yeah that that was like when i was so from five to ten is when i really had to wear it a lot and had to also wear a heel raise in one one shoe on my right hand side because my hips were out of line as well uh, so there's a lot going on as a kid, and I was like, um, I think looking back now, like quite, um, I guess rebellious of it all, because I was like, I just wanted to be normal, you know. Thinking back to it now, I just was like, oh, what, you know, what's going on? Why do I have to wear this, this splint? I'd hide it under the bed, like I, I'd say to mum, I'm wearing, it, but I'm really not. And um, yeah, it was just like a uh yeah, a bit of an annoyance but like looking back now um i really wish i'd wore it more and, and listened more to what the doctor said because you know that's why i'm experiencing all the the tightness and the, the you know the hip alignment stuff so you sort of answered one one of my questions for you actually is like you know did you ever feel different to your peers to which the answer is obviously yes and then in terms of how it affected you well the answer is obviously you, you wanted to be you wanted to be normal but i take it from that riding bikes gave you like true escapism from from that didn't it that must have been really liberating i would have thought yeah 100 percent. it's it's cool that you've picked up on that because it was literally my thought process really um like escapism and um i just found the sport and i was like well it's like i was a sporty kid but um there's just so much freedom here like and i guess i wasn't totally like you know um bound in like mainstream sports so it was something different that I could really kind of you know run with and and do something different and um yeah work on my condition I guess like in that time I wasn't really thinking that way but now I look back now it was always every time I go out it was working on that because you know chucking the bike left and right you know going around the corners building your core strength and and all that it, it's just such a great vehicle for making you an all-round um athlete and you know healthy human beings so um yeah like when i found it i was just all about it and uh yeah it's it's great so you mentioned when you wake up you know you're super stiff you've got to do quite a lot of stretching and just you know quite a lot of exercise to to keep on top of the disability what would happen if you just suddenly couldn't do that anymore like let's say for whatever reason you couldn't ride bikes and you couldn't stretch you couldn't do your exercises like how would that affect you both I suppose physically and mentally, what would happen to you then? Yeah, so it has happened when I've had injuries on in the past. I had a really big injury in 2017 on my left leg, so I was forced to sit around. And basically, what happens is I get so like chronically tight across my hip flexors, so across my hips, um, to the point where I couldn't, I could probably, I wouldn't be able to like cross my legs because um, the the muscle, the way the muscle reacts around my right hand side it goes almost into well like a form of a spasm really so i have to keep you know uh stretching and that and and it makes me like during that time when i was injured it made me like quite you know depressed and and not not motivated at all and um something that you know people that probably listen that will listen to the podcast they probably relate like that kind of mindset that we all go through um but yeah i just with that time um i'm quite good at when i know there's like an end goal a bit like what i was saying before at the start of the podcast with you know the racing if i know there's an end goal i just focus on what 
you know, the day by day, ticking the boxes, okay, foam rolling, stretching, just make it part of your routine every day because, you know, it's it's all about consistency beats, um, you know, all out sprinting, you know, or whatever, you know. You can do something flat out for a couple of weeks and then bin it off. It's not going to do you any good. Just try and be consistent with your routines and whatever you do because, you know, eventually you'll notice a big difference. And, um, yeah, so it would be pretty rough if I lost both of them. But, um, yeah, they are an essential part of my, you know, well-being now. So um, I'm a massive ambassador for for mountain biking and cycling, just, you know, for myself, really. <laughs> I'm I'm not I'm not surprised at all but it's interesting because in a way you know what you do downhill racing training you know the whole kind of sport in general it's pretty high risk and it's like you're playing roulette isn't it like in a way you could end up being injured and it, then it'll have this knock-on effect on like the, the the disability that you can't escape and you kind of got to ride so yeah it's it's interesting how like in a way it solves it but at the same time you, you you you're running this risk of making it worse if you end up being injured because of it um again you sort of partly answer um you know my, my next question in terms of like you've got this routine that you stick to quite closely um how do you how do you stay focused then how do you kind of maintain the stoke to be like right let's stick to the routine even though every part of you just wants to curl up on the settee and not do anything how do you do that that's a great question. Um, I'm like I've I've been through it. Probably last year was uh, quite tough, to be honest, as well at times. But I think uh, having come through that, I think the thing that I can tell maybe the listeners is the feeling after we've all been there on a, you know, really hard effort. Maybe you've been on the gravel bike or the road bike, and it's something you're really satisfied in. And then that feeling you get when you sit on the sofa after, you know, after a big ride or whatever that is you know, a good day racing the downhill bike or, you know, riding the downhill bike or whatever. It's that feeling of satisfaction. So I think to answer your question, the feeling of satisfaction keeps me going. Um and 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 keeping that satisfaction quite tangible, if that makes sense. So if it's just a walk, you know, you've only got time, you know, you people listening or whatever, you've only got time for a walk after work, you know then that's all you can do but be satisfied in in that if that makes sense and i and i really i'm a big believer in that now as i'm getting older like you know whatever the training is that you've got to do do it um because it will make you feel satisfied um and and just learn to just enjoy those small wins because you're not always going to do a 100 mile bike ride because you haven't got time but if you do a 10 mile bike ride it's better than nothing. So, like, I think to answer your question, it's just always something. So, a little bit of something to get that satisfaction on a on a daily or weekly basis is is what's key for me to keep to keep going. Because um, at times I've, you know, been burnt out from training. I've maybe trained too much, or I've raced too much, and I've not enjoyed it. So, yeah, just to really keep it, you know, tangible and and enjoy it. So. No, that's a really good good bit of advice. So I take it for for you, you know, part of the the motivation is to focus on that that end goal, not end goal, but the the reward. Like you know that actually getting out is always going to make you feel better, or that you know doing your exercise is going to help long term. It's not about the kind of gains straight away, but like looking ahead a little bit and keeping keeping focused on that. You know, through this conversation so far, you've already I think highlighted a few things that viewers or listeners could really benefit from. Um, even if they're, you know, just just getting out on the bike for for leisure, um, not racing necessarily, not doing anything professionally. Have you got any other tips for people who might have a similar condition to you that that you think they could really really benefit from um, in relation to the bike or just outside of that? Is there anything else that you can think of that you've kind of learned through the years that's like a super useful tip for people to take home? Yeah, um, for me. Uh, it is so if someone's got a similar condition to me, it would be uh, listen to the doctors straight away. <laughs> uh, but 
uh, stretching and regular exercise is something that I'm a big um, advocate for because, um, like I mentioned before, the you know the the tightness I experience if I don't do my stretches and uh, walking as well because it's great for you know your like your mental health. I'm I'm really into that as well. Like you know if I can't do a can't do a session, but I'm I'm looking at doing some light light uh, light activity. I go for a walk, girlfriend. We go around North Wales, some lovely views and all that. Kind of get those endorphins and that sense of you know good feelings. Um, so yeah, um, little little things like that, stretching and, and walking is is something that uh, you know because like I said before, we don't always have time to to get out and do massive training days. You know, we've got work commitments, kids, whatever, and um, yeah, just keep it keep it like like tangible as i said it before but yeah it's something that's that's something that's within you know that's manageable for you and if it's you know you can't get out in the week because it's dark after work now well maybe you go for a walk or you go to the gym on the treadmill whatever just a few little little bits like that i feel like keeps the keeps the days ticking by and the week's going on so yeah are you are you a full time pro nowadays? Are you are you is that a full time profession for you, or do you combine it with? I think you mentioned coaching as well in the past that you were sort of doing that. Um, what 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 kind of what does your normal day involve outside of training, um, doing your exercises, and perhaps racing? What else do you kind of get up to? Yeah, so I work uh, for my local council, uh, Denbyshire Council. I work as a cycling. Uh, project coordinator so i help um set up the the we're doing next week uh doctor bike sessions so free uh servicing and uh, repair work for select schools around the county so I've, I've set that up to go and um help fix the kids bikes um something that you know it's something that i've been it's really i'm really proud of in in that aspect of my work if you will um so yeah i do that five days a week so that'll be doing projects like that or delivering um cycle safety so bikeability or cycle proficiency so i go around the county um with the team and and deliver those sessions to the kids helping keep them safe whilst riding on the road so it's basically like a a car test but for your bike if that makes sense um so from monday through to friday and I'm very lucky because I've got good hours of work, so it's it's typically about eight till three, and then from three o'clock I'll I'll hit the gym or I'll go out on the trails, um, and I'm local to both of those things, so I'm able to tick both boxes really, and um, kind of work two jobs if you will. Um, on the on the racing side of things, I have some sponsors that help pay towards my events, so I'm very grateful. But you know, it's not my full time full time gig, um, but I represent them in the best way best way possible, and. I think last year I raced 22 events across UK and Europe. Um, so, yeah, busy, um, but I love it. And uh, it's all cycling. So, you know, whether I'm in the schools or out racing myself, uh, it all invo- involves uh, bikes, sorry. And, uh, yeah, just just love that, really. I, uh, <clears throat> I totally resonate with that. I mean, I'm not a racer at all, but for me as well, kind of bikes – Bikes are much more than the sort of leisure side of things. I also kind of paid my wages for a good number of years. Um, and and it's, it's a much bigger picture. But I always thought, why if I couldn't ride bikes anymore? What would you do? Have you ever thought about that? If you, if you just couldn't ride anymore and like somebody said, it's, you're just either not allowed to do it or you can't physically, like, what else would you want to do? Yeah, let's see. I've heard that question a few times on podcasts. Um, I'm never really sure how to answer it myself. But um, so I would say, would I be allowed to be involved in of uh, what's the word? Um, oh, what's the word? Like, coordinating, yeah, coordinating like bike events. Is that allowed? Yeah, I su- yeah, I suppose. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I did no I'm not you know doing it but yeah I don't know I I'd love to like that's what I'm obviously doing now with my work um I love sharing our sport with everyone um because it you know like we've talked about how much it's benefited me I want as many people as possible to find out about it um because of the stuff you know we talked about the physical the mental uh well-being you know the benefits and and all that um you know social benefits bringing people together it's just 
it's an amazing sport. Um, so yeah, coordinating events and stuff, I I try and get involved in if I'm not allowed to ride. Um, but if I wasn't riding bikes at all, oh, I don't know, maybe walking. I don't know. I couldn't do that as a profession, but you know, I I just like being outdoors. Like you know, I, I'm an outdoors person. So if I could be outdoors, and I'm sure everyone listening to this is an outdoors person as well, like anything that involves the outdoors really um because yeah i mean we're lucky that our sport gets us to these amazing places really so um yeah walking or something like that just being in the outdoors really just a professional walker instead yeah i was just thinking when you said like well can it be related to bikes maybe i could be like coordinating events if you couldn't ride it might be like torture you might be stood there going wish i could ride like i wish i could be part of that yeah, that's it. Yeah, so it'd almost be worse. I don't know, but yeah, like I said before, just want to, you know, as many people to find out about it as possible, and if they can take something from my story, um, even better because um, it provided me with it's, it's provided me with a lifestyle that I could never imagine. Really, going around the world and racing these events, and um, it all started from just going up the road to a to watch a mountain bike race. So yeah. No, absolutely. I think it's amazing that, you know, um, until recently, until you actually um, started talking about it yourself, a lot of people won't have known at all and you were kind of achieving all these amazing race results. So, yeah, hats off to you. That's, that's incredible. Um, James, I've got a question for you, which I'm, I'm going to start asking everyone on, on this podcast when I interview them. And it's the first memory that you've got when you really felt that bikes – made you be able to kind of forget about your disability forget about your hardship or kind of like get around it somehow have you got have you got a clear picture in your mind of like that first ride where you're like actually this is this is huge for me and if so explain how that how that felt and what that involved yeah 100 percent. it got it straight away um it was a ride with my dad it's probably the longest ride i've done with him um my dad was a road road racer road cyclist uh raced to quite a good level and was always passionate about getting me on a bike so um i always used to ride up the lane from mine um up to a place called lancelin which is where um, the first race that i watched um, with my family and watched the atherton's um and i remember I'd rode further than I'd ever rode before. We did basically, it's, it's a loop around the back lanes and it goes over um, in up some really steep climbs and stuff. And I remember being able to, because I've been out a few times, climb up some of these big hills with my dad. And I'll never forget the feeling of like coming down the downhills. That's probably why I got into downhill mountain biking, to be fair. And like how fast I was going. It was a nice spring day and... It was like sunny and it's just like, you know, feel good vibes, you know, like, you know, the, come out of winter and, you know, the, the weather's kind of changing and it's, it's it was just a, it was a nice feeling and, and I just remember feeling so free and so, yeah, so alive and it just, it, you know, it, I was like, you know, this is, this is what I really want to, looking back now, I was just enjoying it, but I remember being like, I want to be doing this all the time, you know, doing it as much as I can. And, um, yeah, we did the whole ride and then got back home and I was already looking for a different mountain bike or um, I, I wanted to, like, adapt my bike because I'd watched, like, videos online of, of like, uh, project bikes, like, different coloured paint jobs on the frame and stuff. So, yeah, I remember I remember that day. It was, it was good. And, uh, yeah, it's like my spring i think that's why like this time of year going into spring now is like my favorite time to ride out of all the seasons um because i think i have that that memory in my head of you know going out with dad and and you know just you know like i said the sun and the kind of weather changing and and that day so uh yeah it's powerful just that that you've got that 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 association of that experience to a season and that you know when you go out yeah, when the season's starting to change, you're like, this is my favourite time of the year to go out and ride because it just gives you that kind of feel-good factor nearly automatically. James, is there anything that 
anything else that you wanted to kind of share that we've not covered um, during our chat? Anything that you uh, you feel like we should uh, we should have a chat about? Well, uh, I've met a, a young chap. I forget his name now. Um, hopefully, maybe he's listening to the podcast that had the similar uh, condition to me. Um, hemiplegia uh which is involves all the way down the right hand side and i met him at the glencoe national championships downhill in scotland this year um and shared my tips and and tricks with how i've been able to overcome the, the condition that i've got and and race now to to obviously a good level um and yeah, I just really, if he's listening, I you know, hope he's still chasing the dream and and uh, still getting out on his bike and and enjoying it. It was it was really cool for me to have met someone like myself, if that makes sense. And it was like I could see some of the things that he was or him he was telling me and his mum that he was you know annoyed with um, having to do these things as a kid. And you know, like I said before, if if someone can uh, learn from my mistakes then that's a win for me so um yeah just keep on top of your stretching and uh the doctors because um they're always right the doctors are always right so uh yeah that was just something that sprung to my mind that you know i want to make sure that you know i didn't listen to them as much growing up and it's caused me complications a bit more as i've got older so um just hopefully he's uh sticking to the doctor's word and I mean, obviously, on that note, I'll put a link to your Instagram profile in the description. Um, if somebody stumbles across this interview who's got a similar condition, are you are you happy to kind of share your tips with them beyond this? If they wanted to kind of get in touch with you, are you are you happy to do that? Hundred percent. Yeah, would love nothing more than to to help other people that may be going through what I've gone through, or maybe slightly worse, or whatever. Love to have a chat. So yeah, definitely. Amazing. We'll definitely, we'll definitely do that. James, that's it from me then, mate. By all means, stay in touch. If you're ever up in the lakes as well, it'd be amazing to go and uh, get out for a spin together. I don't think I'm going to be your pace, but it'd be good to have a, a chat anyway and just to sort of catch up. For sure, man. I'd love to. Will do. Thanks for your time. All right, dude. Take care. Perfect. Cheers, mate. Thanks again to James for taking the time to share his story with us. I will put the links to his social tags in the description so that if his story was inspirational to you and you feel that he might be able to help you in any way, um, as he mentioned, you're more than welcome to reach out to him directly. I also just wanted to use this opportunity quickly to thank Amy Dunwell, who's become our biggest community fundraiser um, by organising a casual virtual Everest. Um, now, Everest, as far as I'm concerned, um, is 8,848 meters high, but um, but Amy went and rounded that figure up to 10,000 meters vertical. So spent an entire day in the relative comfort of her home with uh, you know her turbo trainer, and um, yeah, by doing so, not only climbed 10,000 vertical meters, but also raised well in excess of a thousand pounds for rider resilience, which, needless to say allows us to do a lot a lot more so thanks again amy it truly means a lot okay that's it for this episode of the ride it out show i hope you enjoyed it and i look forward to seeing you on the next one take care